This video is brought to you by CatBeast.com. Design your own custom snapbacks and hats. Welcome back to the Hardware Unbox News Corner. Not feeling quite as sick today, which is good news because there's loads of news to cover, including Spectre hitting Intel hard once again, a new GTX 1050 variant, a few bits of game news and more. Let's talk about the new GTX 1050 variant first up because it's probably a bit more interesting than it first appears. The variant is being called the GeForce GTX 1050 3GB as opposed to the original 2GB model. However, it differs from the original in more than just GDDR5 memory capacity. In fact, the CUDA core count, ROP count, clock speeds and memory bus have all changed as well, which just adds confusion to the situation. So the original GTX 1050 is a cut down version of NVIDIA's GP107 die featuring 640 CUDA cores. The GTX 1053 GB, however, has 768 CUDA cores, the same as the GTX 1050 Ti. However, unlike the 1050 Ti, we're looking at a 96-bit memory bus and potentially just 24 ROPs, which is lower than the 128-bit bus and 32 ROPs you get with both the 1050 Ti and original 1050. Perhaps to compensate for this, the core clock speed has been raised higher than both the 1050 and 1050 Ti to 1392 megahertz with a rated boost clock of 1518 megahertz. In short, the 3 gig variant of the GTX 1050 has more memory but less memory bandwidth. It also has a raised core count to match the GTX 1050 Ti and higher clock speeds than the 1050 Ti, yet fewer ROPs. According to Nvidia, this new GTX 1050 3 gigabyte is roughly 10% faster than the original 2 gig model, and while there's no exact price, it should be available soon in the same price bracket as the 1050 and 1050 Ti. Now, I have a problem with the GTX 1050 3 gigabyte. It has a really stupid name and it joins a long list of graphics cards released by both Nvidia and AMD in the past few years with names that just confuse customers. Names like the GTX 1060 3GB, the GT 1030 with DDR4, the MX150 1D12, the RX 560 16 and 14 CU models, all of these are really dumb. Often these cards mess with more than just the memory configurations listed in their names, and that just makes it harder for consumers to know what they are buying. It really isn't that hard for these companies to create a unique product name for each of their graphics cards that easily identifies where the cards lie in the product stack. Nvidia is already using a numbered naming scheme, yet they've just chosen not to use it for cards like the GTX 53GB. Just annoying stuff really, and it only does a disservice to buyers. Let's move on to talk about the latest Spectre vulnerability starting with Spectre Variant 4 or CVE 2018 3639. This particular flaw is part of the Spectre NG family that was discovered after the original set of Spectre issues earlier this year. As you might expect, Spectre V4 also exploits speculative execution and through the use of a side channel, an attacker could potentially read privileged data across trust boundaries. The flaw is also known as Speculative Store Bypass or SSB. Spectre Variant 4 affects most CPU variants vendors, including Intel, AMD, ARM, and more, just like with previous Spectre issues. All CPU manufacturers are working on patches and mitigations for this issue, and it appears Intel is the hardest hit. Their firmware level patch has led to a performance impact of approximately 2-8% to based on overall scores for benchmarks like Sysmark 2014 SE and Spec Integer Rate on both client and server test systems. This patch will be released through OEM system manufacturers and supported through OS software updates in the coming weeks. AMD isn't as effective. They are mitigating SSB through an operating system update for products going back to Bulldozer. The Windows patch is in the final stages of testing and validation, while Linux patches are in development. Early testing from Pharonix on Linux suggests these software level patches have little performance impact. Interestingly, both AMD and Intel are recommending the patch for Spectre v4 be left disabled by default, based on the difficulty to exploit this vulnerability. This means that, at least on Intel systems, you will only experience a performance hit if you specifically enable the patch for extra protection. The other recently discovered Spectre flaw is dubbed Variant 3A, or CVE 2018 3640, otherwise known as Rogue System Register Read, or RSRE. Of the two main CPU vendors, AMD claims they have not discovered any products of theirs affected by this flaw, whereas Intel are affected. Luckily, the patch rectifying this flaw has no performance impact on Intel processors. 
This story probably won't come as a surprise, but NVIDIA and SK Hynix have struck a deal to use GDDR6 memory on upcoming graphics products. It's not clear whether this memory will be ready in time for NVIDIA's set of cards scheduled for release later this year, or whether it will be used across the product stack, but SK Hynix's stock did jump by 6% when the deal was announced. Currently, SK Hynix offers 8 gigabit GDDR6 chips supporting 14 gigabit per second at 1.35 volts or 12 gigabit per second at 1.25 volts. The top 14 gigabit per second option is a fair bit faster than current GDDR5X memory that tops out around 11 gigabit per second. Considering the price of high performance memory, I reckon we'll see GDDR6 appear first in high end cards in place of GDDR5X and as an alternative to the extremely expensive HBM2, though. You know, with all these sort of rumor type stories, who really knows at this point? It feels like I've been covering the story of 4K 144Hz G-Sync HDR monitors every week for the past few weeks now, but hopefully this is the final time I have to mention them on this new show. And that's because this week both Acer and Asus finally, finally have announced these monitors with a proper release date and pricing. The Acer Predator X27 will ship on June 1st with a $1,999 price tag, while the ASUS ROG Swift PG27 UQ will be available later in June also for around that $2,000 mark. In case you're wondering about Australian pricing, ASUS told me their monitor will cost $4,499. And yes, that's not a mistake. A US $2,000 product will cost $4,500 here which is pretty outrageous, but um, I guess what can you do? Anyway, both monitors use the same AU Optronics 3840x2160 HVA panel with a 144Hz refresh rate, 1000 nits of peak brightness, and 384 FALD backlighting zones. It's also quantum dot enhanced with 96% coverage of the DCI-P3 gamut. They support G-Sync HDR as well for a combination of adaptive sync and HDR at the same time. Razer this week announced a new Blade laptop and a new Core-X Thunderbolt 3 GPU enclosure. The Blade in particular looks pretty cool with a refined design, slimmer bezels and a whole host of new hardware. The CPU is upgraded to Intel's Core i7-8750H and on the GPU side you get either an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1060 Max-Q or a GTX 1070 Max-Q depending on how much money you want to spend. RAM varies from 16 to 32 gigabytes and SSD options start from 5 to 12 gigabytes plus there's an 80 watt hour battery inside. As you'd expect from a Razer laptop, the new blade is quite expensive. It starts at $1,900 for the GTX 1060 Max-Q variant and $2,400 for the GTX 1070 Max-Q. It'll be interesting to see whether Razer's thermal solution has improved along with this new design. As the cooler ran a bit hot and loud on previous generations of this laptop and that was just with a 4-core CPU inside. The Razer Core X is a new version of the core that comes in at a far more reasonable price point. The Core V2 cost a ludicrous $500 bucks for what other eGPU enclosures were offering for around 300 bucks, so the new Core X is priced at a much more reasonable 299. It has a 650 watt PSU inside, up from the 500 watt unit in the Core V2, so it can now support even more powerful graphics cards when they exist. There's also a redesigned cooling solution that swaps out five smaller fans for just one 120mm fan, however you do lose USB and Ethernet connectivity in favour of just Thunderbolt 3 for connecting to your device of choice. Like previous models, the graphics card is not included. CryoRig is set to show off their Frostbit M.2 SSD cooler at Computex. This is kind of a strange product considering SSDs don't typically need to be cooled, but here we are with a dual heat pipe cooler for M.2 SSDs with a total dissipation capacity of 12 watts. It's not an active cooler, so you still need some airflow for the best cooling performance, but I guess CryoRig thinks that some fins on an SSD are better than none? Anyway, the design of this cooler even allows for adjustment so the cooler doesn't obstruct your graphics card if the M.2 slot is located near the primary PCIe slot. The design also doesn't interfere with the standard mounting points for 2280 size drives. Anyway, we'll hear more about this at Computex where CryoRig will unveil the price and availability. Moving into the quicker topics now, and this is just a quick PSA that the Steam Spring Sale is currently on. If you want to add another 50 games to your library that you will never play, now is the perfect chance. Next up, and I'm sure a lot of you would have seen this announcement from a few days ago already, EA has officially announced Battlefield 5 for an October release. Interestingly, there's a staggered launch for this game with it first coming out on Origin Access on October 11, then for deluxe edition buyers on October 16, and finally for standard edition owners on October 19. 
It's set in World War II. There is a woman on the cover and as a playable character, which certainly rustled a few jimmies. There is no premium pass this time around, so all map updates in the future will be free. And there's also no loot boxes. However, there will be microtransactions for cosmetic items. PC Gamer has a great article that details everything announced so far about the game, and there's a few interesting changes to some of the gameplay mechanics compared to Battlefield 1. So if you want to know more, you should just go over and check out their article. More will be revealed at EA Play in June. NZXT has released the H500 and H500i cases. The H500 is the more basic of the two with a simple exterior and tempered glass side panel. Of course, you can't go without tempered glass in 2018. There's a removable front bracket to make it easy to install up to a 280mm radiator and you get two 120mm fans included with the case. The H500i is largely the same, but it also includes NZXT's smart device, which is a fan and RGB lighting control hub. The case comes with two pre-installed RGB LED strips and also a vertical graphics card mount, which are not included with the H500, though a riser cable for the GPU will need to be bought separately. Both cases should be available in early June. The H500 price is 70 bucks and the H500i at 100 bucks. Final news topic of the week, some Samsung QLED TVs from their 2018 lineup have received a firmware update that introduces FreeSync support. If you have a Q6FN, Q7FN, Q8FN, Q9FN, or the NU8000, update to firmware version 1103 to get FreeSync through the game mode in the menu. This will be particularly useful if you have a gaming PC hooked up to your TV, or have an Xbox One which will soon be updated to support FreeSync. That's it for this week's News Corner. Don't forget to subscribe so you get this quick news summary in your inbox every Friday, provided YouTube doesn't continue screwing around with it. Consider supporting us on Patreon, and I'll catch you in the next one.